Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about the use of CCTV surveillance in medical practices, particularly in the context of the Protection of Personal Information Act, or POPI, as it's usually referred to. Now, I often hear POPI being described as inaccessible or difficult to apply to a practical situation. And it's true that POPI is a piece of so-called principle-based legislation, meaning that it relies on general and broad principles to guide conduct rather than prescribing a specific set of rules. So in this sense, POPI prescribes certain outcomes or goals that one must achieve rather than spelling out uh, detailed requirements on how to achieve those outcomes. So whilst this may appear intimidating, the benefit of principle-based legislation is that it's more flexible and allows organizations to comply with the spirit of the act, but in a manner that actually fits that particular organization and its unique needs. So I hope that perhaps by the end of today's discussion, you might have a better understanding of how the broad principles outlined in Poppy can be applied to a specific situation, uh, specifically then in the context of the use of CCTV surveillance in a medical practice. Um, now, I thought it might be appropriate to start the discussion today with a short video that I hope will not only demonstrate um, why a doctor might feel that he or she requires CCTV surveillance uh, for security purposes, but which also speaks to broader issues of personal information and information security that Poppy seeks to address. So let's quickly watch that video. medical records stolen from a dental office. And the theft was caught on camera. I would assume where Carlos Granda has a story. It appears the suspect knew exactly what he wanted. Surveillance video clearly shows his face while he's inside the dental office. He goes straight for a cabinet with medical records, grabbing them by the handful and stuffing them into a plastic bag. The value of those records on the dark web, and I've seen estimates that medical records are worth up to maybe a thousand dollars. It happened at around 3 a.m. at Riverside Dental in Sherman Oaks. The suspect broke through this back window to get in. The surveillance video shows he only took medical records and in less than 30 seconds, he leaves going out through the same window. LAPD confirms there is an investigation. No one at the dental office would talk to us on camera today. They say they want to reach out and reassure their patients first. Getting less secure and we become more vulnerable. We did speak with Mike who didn't want to give us his last name. He owns a business next door. Yeah, we do worry. You know, we ask the management to put some security cameras. A little scary, huh? It is, it is, to be honest with you. It's not just for us, but it's also for our clients. You know, they don't feel that safe to even park in the back. This is a low-tech cyber crime, in essence, of stealing records. Vernon says stolen medical records can be a serious issue. They contain personal details such as medical history, insurance information, and maybe even social security numbers. And some fraudulent person can take that information and masquerade as you to get health care, to get an operation, to get a facelift, to get prescription drugs and what have you, because they have all this information that can almost confirm who they are as you. Security experts say to help prevent identity theft in the future, it's a good idea for everyone to monitor their credit reports regularly. Hello, I'm Mark Brown. Get more great ABC7 content by clicking the subscribe button. Okay, so I think the video clearly demonstrates why doctors might consider the installation of CCTV surveillance uh, in their practices to prevent and detect crime and manage their security risks. Obviously, medical rooms often contain expensive equipment, controlled items such as medicines and other supplies that have to be kept safe from theft. Over and above the housing of equipment and medicines, 
confidential patient records are, of course, also typically stored in medical rooms. So the video that we just watched, I would venture, shows every doctor's worst nightmare, just having scores of patient records stolen. So whilst I don't intend talking about the implication of the theft of patient records today, although that would be quite an interesting topic on its own, I nevertheless do intend talking quite a bit about personal information of which uh, patient records are, of course, an example. Right, so I do not want to bore you unnecessarily with legal theory, but I do think it's important to just provide some background context regarding the relevant legal framework. So whilst CCTV surveillance is not specifically regulated under South African law, doctors considering the installation of CCTV surveillance in their practices would, broadly speaking, have to ensure that they comply with the Constitution, in particular the Bill of Rights and the Section 14 Right to Privacy. More specifically, they would have to ensure that the use of surveillance complies with the provisions of POPI. Doctors would, of course, also have to ensure that they comply with the legislation governing their profession, namely the National Health Act, the Health Professions Act, and the ethical rules and guidelines published under the Act. Now, the good news for doctors is that if you're properly compliant, it will necessarily mean that you're also compliant under the Constitution and probably also in terms of the Health Professions Council's uh, professional rules and guidelines. So in that sense, POPI is uh, quite a comprehensive piece of legislation. Right, so as we all know, the Bill of Rights provide that everyone has a right to privacy. POPI specifically provides that the right to privacy also includes the right to protection against the unlawful collection, retention, dissemination and use of your personal information. In essence, the right to privacy entails the right to seclusion from the public, to enjoy personal peace, and to put it very simply, it's the right to be left alone. So it's uh, not just a personality right, the Constitutional Court also recognizes that privacy is a component of your dignity. The invasion of the rights to privacy generally refers to either an unlawful intrusion on your personal privacy or the unlawful publication or public disclosure of private facts. So in the context of CCTV surveillance, one could potentially be dealing with both forms of intrusion. If the surveillance itself is done unlawfully, it would constitute an intrusion of your personal privacy. And if the surveillance is unlawfully shared with third parties, one could also then be dealing with um, a further intrusion in the form of an unlawful publication. All right. However, as we all know, not all invasions of privacy are unlawful and no rights are absolute, including the right to privacy. Section 36 of the Constitution, the so-called limitation clause, provides that the right to privacy may be limited, for example, in terms of copy, to the extent that the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. When determining whether or not the limitation is constitutional, a court will take the factors listed in Section 36 into account. So these factors include, for example, the nature of the right, in this case, the nature of the right to privacy, the importance of the purpose of the limitation. So when we're talking about CCTV in medical rooms, one would have to consider the importance of maintaining security at the doctor's rooms. One would also then look at the nature and extent of the limitation. So in the case of CCTV, the nature and extent of the limitation of the right to privacy might be quite minimal, depending, of course, on the extent of the surveillance itself. You'd also then consider the relationship between the limitation and the purpose. 
a doctor would, for example, have to demonstrate that the limitation of the right to privacy via surveillance is in fact able to achieve the intended purpose of maintaining security at the practice. You'd also then consider whether there might be less restrictive means that you can use to achieve the same purpose, in which case those less restrictive means should generally be preferred. I'll unpack these requirements with you in a little more detail in a moment uh, when we discuss the lawful processing or the uh, conditions of lawful processing outlined in the Act. Now, very briefly, uh, the purpose of copy is, in essence, to give effect to the constitutional right to privacy, specifically then in the context of the processing of personal information. Copy protects information that is processed by both public and private bodies, most importantly by prescribing certain requirements for the lawful processing of personal information. These conditions for lawful processing are of critical importance for each and every individual or organization dealing with personal information. If you're thus able to take away only one thing from today's presentation, I would recommend that it be the importance of familiarizing yourself with these conditions. And we'll get to these conditions in a moment. Uh, but before we do so, let's just first consider when does copy actually apply? Uh, keep in mind that copy does not apply to each and every instance of processing of personal information. Okay, so it's easier to understand the application of copy if it's broken down into triggers, which I've tried to do on this slide. Copy applies to the processing of personal information entered into a record by a responsible party by making use of automated or non-automated means where the responsible party is domiciled in South Africa. Copy also applies to a responsible party who is not domiciled in South Africa, but who makes use of automated or non-automated means in South Africa, unless those means are used only to forward personal information through the Republic. If the answer to all of these triggers is yes, Copy will apply unless one of the exceptions applies. So, for example, copy does not apply to processing of personal information for purposes of purely household or personal activities. Um, the concept of personal or household activity is not defined in copy, but it would relate to processing that does not occur in connection with professional or commercial activities. That being said, it will not necessarily always be easy to determine the exact scope of personal or household use. So for example, we're talking about CCTV, right? Um, if you install CCTV surveillance at your family home for purposes of protecting your property, the cameras might also record people on the street outside, which is a public space. It's unclear whether this would amount to processing for purely personal or household activity. We don't have any um, guidelines or legal cases or, or authority on that yet in South Africa. However, there is some foreign case law uh, that says that if surveillance covers a public space, it might not be purely personal or household activity, and thus copy could potentially apply. However, for purposes of today's discussion, one can safely say that the use of CCTV in medical rooms would not constitute personal or household activity, and that public could thus potentially apply. All right, so the first question is whether your organization is processing personal information. You'll note from the definition quoted in this slide that the concept of processing is defined widely in copy. Basically, processing covers all activities that involve personal information, from its collection to its ultimate destruction. The definition is certainly wide enough to include recording of surveillance footage, as well as the subsequent storage of the footage, its eventual destruction, and if need be, making that footage available to law enforcement. Right. 
The next question is whether your organization, in this case, it would be the medical practice, is processing personal information. Now, I'm not going to read the definition of personal information out to you in full, but it's quoted in the next two slides. And you'll note that Poppy provides a really long list of personal information in this definition. This list is also not exhaustive. Personal information essentially includes almost any information relating to an identifiable living person. The definition of personal information in the Act, although it's not a closed list, does not explicitly refer to CCTV surveillance, as you'll note when you read these two slides. The definition does, however, refer to biometric data. So one might ask whether perhaps video footage is a form of biometric data. In my view, video surveillance by itself probably does not constitute biometric data. Although Poppy is silent on this particular issue, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, states that there has to be specific technical processing of an image in order for it to be considered biometric data. So in my view, um, even though it might not be biometric data, surveillance will nevertheless qualify as personal information. After all, the footage can be used to identify individuals. It should also be noted that CCTV footage is recognized as personal data and is subject to the GDPR, which is quite a good indication that our regulator here in South Africa will probably adopt the same attitude. In order for Poppy to apply, the personal information must be entered into a record and Poppy applies to personal information irrespective of the medium it is recorded on. Record is defined in section one, which I've quoted here in this slide. Again, you'll note, like the definition of processing and of personal information, Poppy also defines the concept of record very broadly. Clearly, then, the recording of surveillance footage on tape or another device would qualify as the entering of information into a record. You'll also note from this definition that it specifically refers to recording of information on film. Poppy provides that a record can be created by automated or non-automated means. In other words, it doesn't matter whether the record is created by a computer or whether it's created by a person. However, if the processing takes place by non-automated means, it must form part of a so-called filing system. Filing system is also defined in section one, and it refers to a structured set of personal information which is accessible according to specific criteria, regardless of whether it is centralized, decentralized, or all in the same place. So for example, an unsophisticated filing system would just be like a lever arch file you have in your office, whereas a more complex filing system might include, for example, a database. The implication of what we've just discussed is that the use of CCTV would fall within the ambit of Poppy. In turn, the doctor in question would qualify as the so-called responsible party in respect of the CCTV footage. In this context, the responsible party refers to the person who firstly determines the purpose of the processing activity, in other words, why is the personal information being processed? And secondly, the person who determines the means for the processing activity. In other words, how is the personal information being processed? It's of course also possible for two or more person to be uh, co-responsible parties. For example, in the context of a group practice or partnership of doctors, assuming they all take joint decisions about the purposes and means of processing the CCTV surveillance. Now, the identity of the responsible party is important because he or she must ensure that the conditions for lawful processing are complied with. In addition to a fine or imprisonment, if he or she, com he or she commits an offense under the act, 
a responsible party may also be exposed to civil liability under the Act. In this regard, data subjects have a right to institute civil action against a responsible party for non-compliance with the Act if this results in an interference with their personal information. And they could be entitled to claim damages, including patrimonial and non-patrimonial loss. Responsible parties might also be held vicariously liable for actions of their employees, provided, of course, that the action of the employee occurred within the course and scope of their employment. As such, it's important for doctors to know you as an employee, as opposed to, for example, uh, another co-responsible party. Now, the conditions for local processing are outlined in Section 8 to Section 25 of the Act. I've quoted them here in this slide, and I will discuss each of these conditions with you briefly in a moment, specifically insofar as a particular condition applies to the use of CCTV surveillance in a medical practice. Firstly, you've got accountability. Now, accountability broadly just means that the responsible party, in this case, it would be the doctor, must ensure that puppy is complied with at all stages. Accountability actually starts before the processing of information commences, and doctors must therefore be accountable at the planning phase as well. In other words, you must also be puppy compliant when planning and deciding how and why CCTV surveillance will be used in the practice. It goes without saying that the responsible party must also ensure compliance at the time of the actual processing of personal information, meaning that the CCTV surveillance itself will have to be com uh, puppy compliant at all times. Puppy provides that personal information must be processed lawfully in a reasonable manner that does not unjustifiably infringe on privacy rights. This is part of the lawfulness of processing the Section 9 limitation. So here you have that word again, reasonable, and you'll note that behaving reasonably is at the very heart of poppy compliance, and it appears over and over again in the Act. Um, as noted earlier, the invasion of privacy is not in itself unlawful, and no right is absolute. Ultimately, whether or not the infringement of privacy is reasonable and justifiable would depend on the assessment of the factors referred to in section 36 of the Bill of Rights, the so-called limitation rules. This exercise will typically require the weighing up of competing interests of various parties, for example, whilst CCTV surveillance might entail an invasion of privacy, the use of surveillance might be crucial to prevent, detect, and prosecute crime and to ensure the safety of staff and patients. So in that sense, the, limita the limitation of the patient's right to privacy might then be justified. When weighing up these competing interests, it's also important to keep in mind that the right to privacy operates along a continuum. This simply means that the law, first and foremost, acknowledges privacy in the truly personal realm. However, as we move into communal relations and activities like business and social interactions, the scope of personal space shrinks accordingly. In this sense, whilst patients might have a legitimate expectation of privacy in a bathroom, or a consulting room or an operating room, the same cannot be said for public spaces like entrance doors, reception, parking bays, and other areas in plain view in and around the practice. As such, a good rule of thumb with regards to the placement of cameras is to consider whether there might be a reasonable expectation of privacy in that area. If your answer is yes, it's not appropriate to install in cameras uh, install cameras in that area. Whether or not, when considering whether or not processing is reasonable, you should also ask yourself whether it complies with the so-called principle of minimality. The principle of minimality, or data minimization, as it's known in other jurisdictions, 
means that personal information may only be processed if given the purpose for which it's processed, it's adequate, relevant, and not excessive. When you consider this definition of minimality, it's actually quite similar and resembles some of the factors outlined in section 36 of the constitution. For example, the principle of minimality, like the factors outlined in section 36 of the Bill of Rights, may require of you to consider factors such as the following, considerations of necessity, and proportionality. So, for example, is the use of CCTV reasonably necessary to keep the practice safe? Is the processing not perhaps excessive given the intended purposes? For example, installing CCTV in the ladies' rooms would be excessive and not necessary for purposes of maintaining safety at the practice. Doctors must never collect, and this is a good rule of thumb, never collect more personal information than what is needed to fulfill the purpose for which you are collecting that information. Are there perhaps other reasonable and less invasive means to achieve your intended purposes? And will the processing that you plan to do actually achieve your purpose for processing that personal information? If not, it's probably not relevant, probably doesn't comply with data minimization, and it might then get you into trouble. So in summary, CCTV surveillance should be regarded as a legitimate limitation of the right to privacy, provided that the surveillance is reasonable, proportionate to its purpose, and necessary. Some guidelines here or rule, rules of thumb, CCTV in a med medical practice should be limited to potential problem areas like entrances, storage rooms, and dispensing areas. Cameras should ideally not be directed or directly focused on areas where patients might be sitting, like a waiting room. And CCTV in a consultation room or other private areas like a bathroom or operation room will be an absolute no-go. Copy requires that you must always have a legal basis for the processing of personal information. A legal basis could, for example, include the data subject's consent, a contractual right to process the information, if you're obligated by law to process the information, if processing protects a legitimate interest of the data subject, or if processing is necessary for purposes of pursuing your legitimate interests. Now, in the context of CCTV surveillance, the most likely legal basis for processing would, in my view, relate to the legitimate interests of the doctor. Could one consider consent as a legal basis for surveillance? In my view, it would be very difficult to base CCTV surveillance on consent, simply because it would be impractical to obtain valid consent from every single person entering the premises. Um, apologies, I just lost my slide here. Keep with you in a second. Here we go. More likely, the use of CCTV surveillance would be justified to the extent that doctors have a legitimate interest in the collection of personal information by way of surveillance and the right to implement reasonable measures to maintain security at their practice. Okay, so what do I mean when I say that the processing of the information is necessary to pursue my legitimate interest? The concept of legitimate interest is unfortunately not defined in Poppy. However, it could include commercial, individual, or even broader societal interests of either the responsible party or of third parties. Keep in mind that the responsible party's interest in the processing must be distinguished from the purpose of the processing activity. So the purpose is the specific reason why the information is being processed. For example, 
CCTV footage is connected to the term crime and identify possible culprits of crimes committed at the practice. On the other hand, the responsible party's interest in the processing activity is the broadest stake that the doctor has in the processing. In other words, the benefit that he or she might derive from the processing activity. For example, protecting his or her commercial interests and keeping patients and staff safe. That being said, keep in mind, just because you have legitimate interest in the processing of personal information does not mean it's a free for all. And it does not necessarily mean that the processing will be lawful um, under section 11. You must still be able to demonstrate that the limitation of the data subject's privacy is, here's that word again, reasonable, and your legitimate interest can actually be trumped by the interest or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject. Okay. Although Poppy does not provide any guidance to determine when the processing of personal information would be justified based on the legitimate interests of the responsible party, there are some very helpful guidelines internationally particularly those outlined by the Information Commissioner's Office. The ICO is the UK's independent body set up to uphold information rights. You can find very detailed information on so-called legitimate interest assessments on the ICO website. In essence, an assessment of this nature would require of the doctor to firstly identify legitimate interest. So, for example, protecting property, staff, and patient safety. This is referred to as the so-called purpose test by ICO. Secondly, to show that the processing of information via CCTV surveillance is necessary to achieve that interest, ICO refers to this as the necessity test. And lastly, to make sure that the interests of the doctor are reasonably balanced against the rights and freedoms of third parties, including the right to privacy of data subjects. ICO refers to this as the so-called balancing test. So as noted earlier, you can find a lot of information about legitimate interest assessments online on the ICO website, including specific questionnaires to consider um, for purposes of each leg of the test, which is quite useful. And I would recommend that you maybe go look that up. Um, I have quoted some of the questionnaires in the next three slides, just to give you an indication of what a legitimate interest assessment might entail. So you've got part one, the purpose test, the necessity test, and the balancing test. Unfortunately, we do not have time today to go through these questionnaires, but the slides will be made available upon request and the questionnaires are also available online on ICO's website. Poppy requires that personal information may only be collected for a purpose that is specific, explicitly defined, lawful, and related to a function or activity of the responsible party. It's very important that you are specific when defining the purposes of your processing. For example, saying that CCTV surveillance is required for general practice and business purposes would not be sufficient. That's not specific enough. Knowing the purpose of the processing is a prerequisite for applying various other data quality requirements as well. For example, the principle of minimality is determined in relation to a specific purpose. It will be impossible to determine the appropriate retention period for personal information if the purpose for which the information was collected is not properly defined. The notification duties described by Poppy cannot be met if the purpose is not specified. The, lawful, uh, the lawfulness of the processing also cannot be assessed without knowing what the purpose of the processing activity is, et cetera, et cetera. I can give many more examples to illustrate why purpose specification is so important under the Act. Apart from the fact 
that the purpose of the collection must be specific, explicitly defined and lawful, it must also be related to a function or activity of the responsible party. Although the information regulator might have to issue clearer guidelines in this regard, I would certainly say that measures taken to protect practice property, the property of patients and staff, and even protecting the safety of staff and patients themselves are indeed related to the general running of a medical practice. I'm dissatisfied that the use of surveillance at a medical practice could be related to a function or activity of the doctor. Okay. As noted earlier, appropriate retention periods for personal information are determined with reference to the purpose for which the information was collected. Section 14 of the Act provides that you may retain a record of personal information for as long as needed to achieve the purpose for which the information was collected or subsequently processed. A doctor will probably only need to retain CCTV footage for a couple of weeks, since an incident like theft at the practice, for example, will typically come to light very quickly. However, the practice might then need to retain footage a little bit longer if a crime was reported to the police, at least until the police has collected the footage. When all the justifications for retaining footage have expired, the doctor will have to destroy, delete, or de-identify the footage as soon as reasonably practical. For a record to be considered deleted or destroyed, it must not be possible to reconstruct the record in an intelligible form. So one must also um, just always be very careful when you're deleting or destroying digital data, right? Because it's not as easy to destroy digital data as say, destroying paper records. Keep in mind that as long as digital data can still be reconstructed or retrieved in any way, you have not actually yet complied with the destruction requirements under Poppy. Okay. As a general rule, the further processing of personal information should be compatible with the initial purpose of collection. This is just another reason why documenting the purpose of collection is so very important. Further processing of CCTV footage may, for example, include sharing that footage with law enforcement. Now, Poppy provides some guidelines in order to assess the compatibility of your new processing activity, including, amongst others, the relationship between the purpose of further processing and the purpose of the initial collection. In essence, to make it simple, if the new purpose was implied in the original purpose, in other words, if it's a logical next step, it will be compatible. In my view, sharing CCTV footage with law enforcement will be compatible with the initial purpose of collection, as sharing footage of a crime with the police would be a logical next step pursuant to the collection of that footage. A good rule of thumb uh, when you're considering uh, combat compatibility of further processing is to ask yourself whether the data subject will be surprised to learn about the further processing. So I tried to think of an example to demonstrate this um, at the hand of CCTV. And I think a, a good example might be for, um, whilst it would be in order to disclose CCTV footage of a theft at the practice to police, I would not recommend that a doctor, for example, disclose CCTV footage of a patient entering and leaving the practice at a certain time as part of that doctor's response to a patient complaint at the Health Professions Council of South Africa. Clearly, using that footage as evidence when responding to a complaint at your regulator is not compatible with the initial purpose of collection, where that initial purpose was preventing, detecting, and prosecuting crimes that are committed on your premises. In terms of information quality, a doctor must take reasonable, practical steps to ensure that personal information is complete, accurate, 
not misleading and updated where necessary, having regard to the purpose for which the information was collected. Now, this requirement is a little bit difficult to apply to CCTV, but doctors should probably then ensure that the use of a surveillance system um, must be capable of producing footage of a suitable quality, having regard to the purpose of the surveillance. So if your purpose of surveillance is to detect and prevent crime, the CCTV system should in fact be capable of recording clear footage that can be used to identify potential offenders. Copy, amongst others, aims to promote transparency towards data subjects. This is achieved through the condition of openness. Openness, amongst others, requires the responsible party to maintain the documentation of all its processing activities as required by Section 51 of the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Now, I think we're all already familiar with this by now. Um, Section 51 refers to your so-called FIRE manual, which must be maintained by all private bodies. So FIRE manual must, amongst others, inform members of the public of the categories of information held by the practice. And this information would include CCTV footage captured on your premises. The public should also be able to request access to the information held by the practice, potentially including CCTV footage, subject, of course, to the grounds of refusal listed in the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Another way in which Poppy promotes transparency is by requiring responsible parties to inform data subjects of the fact that their personal information is being processed. This is referred to as so-called privacy notice. Section 18 of the Act contains an extensive list of information that must be disclosed to data subjects. Data subjects must, at the very least, be informed of the following. Fact that information is being collected, the purpose of collection, the name and address of the responsible party, whether or not the supply of the information why the data subject is voluntary or mandatory, consequences of failure to provide the information, and the particular law authorizing or requiring collection of the information. In addition, if necessary to ensure that the processing is reasonable, a data subject must also be informed of the recipient or category of recipients of the information, the nature or category of the information, the right to access the information, your right to object to processing, and your right to complain to the information regulator, as well as the contact details of the regulator. Now, in the context of CCTV surveillance, a section 18 notice would require of the doctor to notify data subjects about the fact that they are being recorded. The notice is obligatory unless one of the grounds of exception outlined in the Act apply. Amongst others, the Act provides that a responsible party does not have to comply with Section 18 if compliance is not reasonably practical. In my view, whilst it would be impractical to individually notify each and every person entering the premises of the presence of CCTV surveillance, a doctor would definitely be obligated, at the very least, to place signs around the practice, located at strategic points, alerting the public to the fact that there are cameras installed. Generally, the notification cannot take place after the fact, and the data subject must be informed before the personal information is collected. This might for example, require a conspicuous CCTV sign being erected at the entrance of the practice, or having patients sign a CCTV privacy notice in the visitor's register or when opening a new file with the practice. In addition, in the interest of transparency, doctors should ensure that the surveillance should not be covert, 
In other words, the cameras should be in plain sight. I would not recommend including a consent clause in a CCTV privacy notice like this. So for example, I would advise against inserting a clause to the effect that uh, by entering this practice, you consent to the processing of your personal information via CCTV surveillance. I don't think that consent would be valid. Um, Poppy defines consent, and for consent to be valid under Poppy, it must be a voluntary, specific, informed expression of will. So valid consent involves a genuine choice where the data subject actually has the option to say no. It also involves an affirmative act. So consent by default or an automatic opting in um, for the processing of your information would not qualify as valid consent on a popping. Okay. I have in the next two slides, and I've divided it over two slides, um, provided you with an example of a CCTV privacy notice that I had prepared myself. Um, it should be noted that a medical practice does not necessarily only have to have a single comprehensive privacy notice. So there could be several different privacy notices relating to the various forms of information processing that takes place at the practice. In my view though, it makes sense to have a separate CCTV privacy notice, but Poppy is not prescriptive in this regard. So you can do whatever you think is best. So you'll note that I've included the following information in the notice. First of all, um, under about us, I've included the name and the address of the responsible party. And then on the notification, I've included the fact that CCTV footage is being collected. I've then also disclosed the purpose of the collection, which I made sure is explicit and very specific. And then I've also, under item four, included the fact that the collection of the footage is authorized in terms of copy. Now, you'll note that whilst Poppy does not require of the responsible party to disclose the legal basis for processing in a privacy notice, I've actually chosen to specifically declare um, the legitimate interest basis for my proce processing in my notice. Poppy provides that when a responsible party relies on this particular justification, the data subject may object to the processing activity at any time on reasonable grounds relating to his or her situation. So in my view, although the act does not explicitly require of it, uh, you to do it, I think it would be important to disclose when you're relying on legitimate interest as the legal justification for your processing, because the data subject then has a right to object based on reasonable grounds. Fortunately, Poppy doesn't explain what an object of, uh, of this nature might actually entail and how you would have to respond to it. However, if a data subject objects to processing, the responsible party will probably have to stop the processing unless he or she is able to show that there are in fact legitimate grounds for the processing, which overrides the data subject's interest. Obviously, a responsible party would also be able to disregard an objection that is simply unfounded because the objection will then not be reasonable. Moving on to the second page of my template notice, I have further stipulated the fact that the supply of information is mandatory. Obviously, you cannot enter the premises without being captured on camera. I've then gone further and also included information regarding the fact that the footage may be disclosed to law enforcement. And I've covered the data subjects' rights on the puppy, including the right to establish whether the practice holds information about you, and if so, to request access, the right to request the, uh, the destruction um, of irrelevant, excessive, unlawful, or out of date information and the right to object to the processing of information on reasonable grounds. And then lastly, the right to lodge a complaint with the regulator. Right. 
So in this slide, I've included a very basic example of what a CCTV notice might look like. These signs should be placed around the practice, particularly in the areas actually being monitored and definitely at the entrance, most importantly. Uh, remember that the camera should be installed in plain sight and should not be covert. And as an added safety net, these, uh, these signs should be erected in addition to having data subjects sign privacy notices, as it might not be realistic to have each and every person entering the premises sign a notice. So these signs would be quite important as a, a, saf a safety net. Right, so in terms of the act, doctors also have a duty to take appropriate and reasonable technical and organizational measures to prevent loss, damage, unauthorized destruction, and unlawful access to surveillance footage. To do so, doctors have to take reasonable measures to identify reasonably foreseeable internal and external risks. These could include, for example, human error, data loss, hacking, physical theft, what have you. They must also establish and maintain appropriate safeguards against the risks and regularly verify that the safeguards are effectively implemented and then ensure that the safeguards are continually updated in response to new risks or deficiencies. Fortunately, uh, Poppy doesn't define reasonable measures and merely provides that when considering acceptable security measures, due regard should be had to the generally accepted information security practices and procedures in that industry. This could, for example, include in encryption or other appropriate technical method methods to ensure the safety and security of the footage. At minimum, I would say that the CCTV footage should be securely stored in order to prevent unauthorized access. Doctors must also inform data subjects if there are reasonable grounds to believe that their personal information has been accessed or acquired by an unauthorized person. So for example, this would occur if the CCTV footage is lost or stolen. You also then have to inform the information regulator. Now, Poppy doesn't define reasonable grounds to believe, but it will likely require more than a suspicion or the mere possibility. You would at least have to have some evidence to back up your belief. The notification must be in writing and must be communicated to the data subject in at least one of the following ways. Um, you might email to the last known address, uh, mailed, placed in a prominent position on the website, published in the news media, or in whatever manner or format the regula regulator tells you to do it. The content of the notification described um, is outlined in section 22 in the Act, and I've quoted it on this slide. A notification about a security compromise might have to be quite comprehensive, depending on the nature of the breach and the type of information involved. For example, if you're dealing with credit card information or that absolute nightmare scenario in the video we watched at the beginning of, of this presentation. However, a notification that CCTV footage has been lost or stolen would likely be relatively straightforward as it would probably not constitute a high risk security compromise that would require extensive measures to mitigate the possible damage. Obviously, it might not be practical or possible to identify and notify all of the affected individuals, in which case a general notice at the practice or on the website would be sufficient. Generally, the notification should be done as soon as reasonably possible, However, the notification might be delayed if the police or the information, information regulator determines that notification will impede a criminal investigation. So, for example, the police might request a doctor to hold over on informing data subjects of the security breach in circumstances where it may be wise to conduct a sting operation.
Okay. Data subjects also have a right to access their personal information. Data subjects would thus be entitled to inquire whether the practice is in possession of any CCTV footage in respect of the data subject, to be provided with a description of that footage, or to be provided with access to the footage. The data subject would also be entitled to information regarding the identity of third parties who have or who have access to the footage, for example, if it was disclosed to law enforcement. In my view, a request for CCTV footage might have to be refused unless it's possible to blur out the faces of innocent bystanders and other patients appearing in the footage. Um, this is because, in general, a data subject is only entitled to access to a record of their own personal information, but not the personal information of somebody else. And unreasonable disclosures of personal information about a third party is not permitted under the Promotion of Access to Information Act. Keep in mind also that the mere attendance at medical rooms could potentially be confidential, the, the fact that you went to see the doctor and that you are appearing on that footage. Data subjects would also have the right to request the doctor to correct or delete their personal information if it's inaccurate, irrelevant, excessive, out of date, incomplete, misleading, or obtained unlawfully. And data subjects may also request the destruction or deletion of personal information if the doctor is no longer authorized to retain it. So in summary, the limited use of CCTV surveillance in a medical practice should be lawful. However, there are potential ethical and legal pitfalls, as we have discussed today. Until the information regulator or the Health Provision Council issues detailed guidelines, doctors should preferably adopt a conservative approach and remain mindful of the guidelines we discussed today. These include, to recap, limit the surveillance to the minimum necessary. Surveillance should be conducted for a specific, lawful, and clearly defined purpose. Remain transparent. This will require notifying the public of the surveillance and installing cameras in plain sight. Safely store your footage. Destroy it once you no longer need it and limit and control access to and disclosure of the footage. To stick to these guidelines, you should be within the law and um, you should minimize your risk. Thank you very much, Ms. Helica, for the amazing and informative presentation. Unfortunately, due to the interest of time, we are unable able to take any questions. However, we will respond to all the questions that have been actually posted on the chat as well as on the Q&A. Uh, furthermore, kindly note that um, it is our Cyber Month, so please be on the lookout for our Cyber Awareness Week. It's going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays.